Hey friends, welcome back uh, here with a really special guest. His name is Christian Sapita. He's actually my former high school teacher. Uh, he's the department head here at St. Marcelina Secondary School uh, for the Department of Science and also has, uh, has led the development of the science curriculum uh, for grade nine students with the Ministry of Education as well. So he has a lot of experiences under his belt. He's an educator and a leader in, that, in, that, in the education space. So Mr. Sapita, welcome. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. It's great, I feel a little bit old being your former high school teacher. I think it was grade 12. Um, yeah, so I, I, science, I really like science. Of course, I'm an educator, like being involved, having my hand in, in where I think science needs to go, where I think education science specifically needs to go. I helped to write, I was one of a great group uh, that helped to write the new grade 9 D-Stream curriculum, which has an important component. Uh, one strand of it is, is electricity, and an important part of that is energy production, alternatives to energy production. So certainly this is up, up, our, up the alley up for sure. Awesome, that's great. No, uh, sir, you're not old, or old at all, actually. <laughs> when, I, when I met you, you're, you're looking the exact same <laughs> as when I was in high school. <laughs> yeah, still have that youth. So, uh, sir, you know, tell us a little bit about your, uh, your background and you know, getting into the education space, right? And tell, tell us about you know, uh, your, your passions around that. So it's all, I guess it all started off, I just, I've always had an interest from being a kid to, to now, of course, but I've always had an interest in science. And what's interested me a lot as, as, as I've gained more years of experience in education is um, science communication and science literacy. It's why I appreciate what you do, Islam. It's really important that science is communicated. Not enough of that is done. It's an important, it's an important thing to do for people to, for, to make science accessible so people can make, their, make informed decisions. Science shouldn't be something inaccessible to, to people that are only educated in that field, so this is important to do. Um, and then it's been making science accessible to everybody, not just in their understanding, but everyone, no matter your background, no matter what, uh, not, what, what faith, culture, uh, gender, race, or anything like that. Everyone needs to, have, needs to have science in their life needs to see themselves in the science, see themselves in the classroom, see themselves in, in, the, in the textbook. So I've been involved also with the uh, Science Teachers Association of Ontario, done lots of great work with them, great group that have, that align, I guess it's just naturally aligns with how I see science as well, um, in, in making sure that it's accessible to everybody, that it's, it's delivered in a, in, in, in a certain way. So we've done lots of work with that through them as well, provincially too. Um, and then being, being a science teacher, just in, the every, in the every individual one-on-one -on -one every day, interaction with students, hopefully making an impact, hopefully one student at a time, day at a time, uh, that's what I really enjoy. That's, that, that's great, I, I love the accessibility component and, um, and, and, and your vision for, you know, no matter, no matter who you are, you should have access to, uh, to that source of education. So, you know, tell me about, sir, in the past 10 years or so, you know, climate change is such a big hot topic right? Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a lot of other issues and challenges uh, when it comes to science and that science can help contribute toward, you know, tell me a little bit about students nowadays and how they feel toward science education. Are they becoming more passionate in that area? It's hard to measure how passionate they might be. I hope they're continuing to get more passionate about it. It's, it's such an important climate change specifically, if we're talking just about, about that specifically, it's, it's, it's really important to address. It's been in our curriculum even before this last, this recent change. Um, it's, I think it needs to be in the forefront. All of the, especially for the grade nine curriculum that, that was just changed, all of the strands, all of the units um, that, that's within that curriculum and even in other courses and other science courses, they all touch on STSE, science, technology, and the environment. They, they have some connection to, to, to the environment and climate change specifically. What's great about the grade nine new curriculum is that it's front and center. There's connections that can be made to the, to the science, to, in every science unit to climate change. So students have a hard time, I think, with climate change. It's changed over time. I shouldn't say they have a hard time. They have, they ha there it might be some anxiety that climate change causes them because they're experiencing it, they're living it. Whereas maybe 10, 15 years ago when I started, um, climate change was something existential. It was something a bit further out. It doesn't, it's, yes, it, it exists. Although even that fortunately has, has, uh, has changed. Now it's no longer does it exist. Whereas the evidence is we know it exists. There's no doubt about it. We know that we're causing it. Now it's the focus is on more what are the alternatives? What can we do now? What are the alternatives regarding um, energy production? So <clears throat> there's also great 
um, topics to introduce, to topics to talk about with regards to energy production. Um, what I'm, and, and inspired by, so I have to say inspired by you as well, uh, what I'm trying to promote is um, the alternatives which include nuclear, nuclear energy. Right, there's many great, we talk about wind power, solar power, geothermal power, all, all great and great um, forms to generate electricity, but a key stepping stone to Canada's net zero, net uh, carbon zero um, goal in 2050 is, has to be nuclear energy. And that is, that will be part of it. That will be um, part of our present, it is, and, and a, an important good part of our present, our current moment and, and into, into the future as well. So that, letting them change that, there's often a misconception that nuclear energy is bad, it's dangerous, it's these disasters. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge to overcome that innate perception. Um, and then also to show students that yes, climate change is, 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 is a serious issue, but there's hope and that's that anxiety I want to overcome. So those are the challenges I have and, and I think that we have to work hard at overcoming. You know, one thread that I wanna pull at is, you know, you, you spoke about a little bit about energy literacy, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and how nuclear energy, the perceptions around that need to be changed a bit. Um, tell us a little bit about your experiences uh, developing the science curriculum with the Ministry of Education here in Canada. Like, that's that's a significant role I think you played yeah. uh, in leading that. Tell us a little bit about uh, it that. Was, it was exciting because it's something I applied to and I thought, oh, I'll just see what happens. Um, and then time goes by and wondering, I haven't heard, and that's okay. And it was just a pipe dream or just something I'm gonna try. And then I got in, I got a uh, communication saying, you got in, and wow, this is great because it's a, small group of people in the province and so fortunate to work with incredible, incredible educators. It's also why I like working with STEO, the Science Teachers Association of Ontario, because they're just such incredible educators and they see the larger vision of science that not just a textbook you have to follow or not just a lab that has to get done, but these are people that are, that are, that are going to be citizens and whatever they do, informed citizens are making decisions and not just what they purchase and how they vote and, and, and how they conduct their lives. So that was, it was an honor, to, an honor to be part of that group. And then to bring my perspective as well, everyone has, has incredible backgrounds that were part of this writing group. Um, um, so it, I, I brought the, what I know about energy um, and trying to dispel those myths as well. Um, I don't think anyone ever thought within this group that it was anything bad at all, but let's, let's, let's continue to work against dispelling any, any, any untrue myths about, about energy and other things too. Um, love working with in the, in the equity space as well in education, equity in many things like I mentioned, culture, race, faith, gender. We all need to see ourselves in science. And then also see the alternatives there are. How is energy, how does energy, how is energy produced around the world? How equitable is it to access it? Um, so it's those innovations in science as well that I find really fascinating that I think is unique to Canada as well that I want to, I want to bring that update of, of knowledge of, of, the, of, of the nuclear space that unless you're interested, like many people are, but unless you are interested in it, maybe you just don't know about these things and that's okay. So that's why the curriculum's here. That's where our educators are encouraged to, to continue learning, be a lifelong learner and be that person that is able to fill in those gaps help dispel any myths. So being part of that group was awesome. Got to put in my little two cents into it among other great educators around the province. Um, so that was, it was an honor and it was great to be part of that. And now I feel like this is this curriculum, this new curriculum is kind of my baby. I want to make sure that it does well and does what it's supposed to do. That's, that's great. It's, it, 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 it's phenomenal that you had that opportunity. Could you tell us a little bit about how the Ministry of Education mm -hmm. works? How does a science curriculum for a school get developed? And um, how is it updated? And how does the process work? Like, are you working in a team to achieve that? So could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, so from my experience, I know there's probably a lot more that goes on behind the scenes that I'm not very aware of. And from what I know, it's, um, it's, it, takes, it takes years to do. <clears throat> studies come out, or studies are commissioned by the ministry to see, are we doing, are we doing, um, are we doing well? Is the curriculum well designed? Is it meeting the needs? Of, of students, is it meeting the needs of post-secondary through different pathways, so college, apprentice level, apprenticeships, colleges, universities, workplace, are they, are they all meeting, is a curriculum suiting the needs of students now and possibly in the future, what, where also are the needs uh, that, that communities have expressed? Um, so there's some studying that goes on, some studying done by, by the ministry through other third parties to develop their, uh, to realize that there's a need and then to develop a new curriculum. 
once that is done, um, the process in the ministry don't know exactly of what happens. I know is, is that uh, one component is that they reach out to the educators, and I appreciate that happening. So the educators, people that are uh, that are our teachers or that are leaders in education that will then come together. So there's a smaller group is formed. Of course, there's a, there is a French group, there is an English-speaking English group, and we have all have different backgrounds, and I like the diversity of, of everyone that is part of this, this group. Um, I'm gonna say, through a guess, I, I can't remember exactly, but about a dozen or so. Um, we get together and we meet and it was because of COVID it was meeting a lot uh, it was meeting virtually a lot and that was still great we got to communicate with everyone from different parts of the province there was that was a bit of a silver lining I think uh, working with um, teachers that work in rural schools in French schools all over the province with everyone having different needs and different perspectives so that then we then we then write we have expectations that are already set out we add to those that is then taken under consideration as, as, a, as a writing group uh, by the ministry ministry officers and they have their expert writers and they take what we develop and they come up with a curriculum. Some things make it, some things don't, some things are tweaked, but the final product is now, is now public and has been for a little while. Uh, more is being added to it, more of our work is, is, is coming out. Um, teacher exemplars, pedagogical supports are, are, are coming and continue to come out, things that we worked on. So that's generally, I'm sure there's more behind the scenes, but that's generally my experience. Yeah, it's a really good overview of the process and, and how things come together. You, you know, when it comes to the science curriculum, yeah, let's, let's deep dive into the energy literacy space. When it comes to high schools, uh, the, 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 the curriculum, to what level are students, you know, it's, it's been a while since I've been in high school, but uh, to what students, have, to, to what level have, have is energy uh, literacy integrated within the curriculum right now? And are, are there, is there room for improvement? Oh, there's for sure. So we'll, we'll, I'll answer the last part. There certainly is room for improvement because I would love for the term energy literacy to be explicitly included somewhere. And I am reviewing some literature that will help teachers, some textbooks that help teachers um, um, with that. So hopefully we see that or something like that. But I would love for it to be somewhere explicitly written energy literacy because you have those myths I talked about. So um, what seems sometimes in people's minds just because of, of, of media and culture is that the disasters are amplified and the benefits are almost minimized or just not addressed because maybe they're just not known. Um, we, we grew up hearing about, the, about disasters and those are for sure awful things, but they are, they're, they're part of it, but they're not the whole story. And if, unless we paint the whole story properly, we can get these myths that come out. So then, being, um, then showing students that there is more to this one facet, to this one bad facet of it, there's, that's just one part of it. And that's one part of it that may have happened for very unique, very different reasons that are very unlikely to happen now. There are other types of ways to, to, to produce energy, uh, zero emission, um, unique Canadian contributions, important unique Canadian contributions. Uh, we're, curriculum always wants to be uh, a world view, but also what has Canada done? What, let's, let's bring it back home. And Canada has so much to offer. And I would love to talk about can-do reactors, love to talk about how safe it is with all of the safety um, uh, safety layers, mechanisms that are involved in making sure that it is safe and controlled um, and seeing how the role that it, will, that it will continue to play in the future. You have those, and you, of course, know more than I do about this, but those modular, those mobile nuclear plant, nuclear um, plants are coming out and that, that can then, that then means that nuclear energy can be more accessible to those rural communities, those, very, those communities that very, that very much need accessible energy that may rely heavily right now on diesel or, or biofuels, things that have that naturally produce a lot more emissions and that contribute to, to, to climate change. Well, now we have nuclear energy as, as a possible solution, whereas it was just seen as currently, I think now one of the myths is, well, it's only for the major cities. It's only for certain parts of Ontario or certain parts of Canada or the world. But with, with this unique approach, that is that that is that is starting here in Ontario. It's great now we can have access, and that I think needs to come out to the forefront. So there's that type of awareness as part of literacy. I think has to start there, um, and, and and not not trying to embellish anything. But these are the facts. These are the facts. This this is these are the safety measures that 
the incredible safety measures and 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 uh, and uh, history that Canada has on on ensuring that they that they are that they're kept and they're maintained. So all of those good facts, even the bad ones, that paints a proper picture so that we can dispel those those myths and and help to improve sci uh, science literacy, energy literacy, while also talking about the other great parts of. Uh, of, of science production, right? Your, your, your wind, your solar, all of those things that are needed, all together are needed to help, help fight climate change and help reach Canada's zero net goals. Absolutely, yeah, it's not a one-stop shop. Like we, we need all these technologies and really have that um, technology agnostic approach, right? So I, I you know, I, I, yeah, I, I, I love your approach there when it comes to energy. Another question I have is, you know, recently ISO, ISO released a report um, highlighting that we would need to double our energy capacity, electricity production capacity, right. which means we need a lot more megawatts on the grid, mm -hmm. and which is also positive because there's a huge, uh, huge potential for careers in this industry, mm -hmm. right? Are students aware about the energy needs of the future and how there's going to be so much demand in terms of jobs and careers. I expect them after they've done my class, <laughs> they hopefully they are because one of the one of the we've realized that um, it's really important along with all of the science concepts taught in class, <clears throat> all of the applications of science concepts taught in class that kids know where to go because ultimately the point of education is is to make productive citizens, productive people, but also you meet, people need jobs. Ultimately, that's it. You finish high school, you go on to college, university, whatever pathway. So what are those pathways? And I think that has to be embedded in every science course. Um, it's explicitly stated in, in, the, in the grade nine course, where we look at, at different career paths and different education pathways. Um, while not placing one on a pedestal, but showing that it's a, it's a combination of many pathways that you can follow that will give you happiness, success, be able to allow students to contribute to society. So trying to also show that there's great things you can do in, the, in, a, in a college stream, great things you can do in a university stream and, every, and everything in between, before and after. Um, so they are, they need to be more aware, yes, and they need to be more aware that there are these different options for them. Are they aware? No, that's the goal. And I think that's part of, uh, part of certainly energy literacy or energy, the energy space specifically, but it's, it's in every, it's in every unit in the grade nine course. It's, it needs to be in every, it needs to be approached maybe to different extents in other, in the rest of the science courses as well, both intermediate and senior courses. But grade nine really sets, sets the stage for what, where do I want to go with science? What are my options? Grade nine and 10 does that. And so it's important to talk about those pathways. So do they know that they have these opportunities? I hope they do after you finish with my course. Um, I, I trust they do. More work has to be done. I think we need to continue to listen to great podcasts, great videos, great resources of different kinds to learn more because it's changing so much. Um, there, are, there are jobs that, that uh, don't exist yet that, that students will have. So showing them that, I think it's important. They need to know so they know that there's different options for them. So there's work to do, there's yeah. work to do. Educators are lifelong learners. There are great teachers across the province, great teachers in the school that are doing that. They're researching what are the different careers, what are the different pathways, because things have changed. We have been in teaching for however many years in this, in this one space, and we're continuing to learn what are the options that we can then present to kids so that they know what to, what to possibly get into. So there's work working on it. It's great to know that there's, there's a lot of work going on in this area. And I think that's something that the industry itself is, uh, it's a challenge that the industry itself will face, right? Because how can we work with schools? How can we work with, uh, with the Ministry of Education uh, to make sure that the industry effectively communicates its needs or its anticipated needs mm -hmm. to educators, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it goes both ways, right? I think the industry really needs to work on how are we effectively gonna work together with educators to um, to make sure that students know that there's this need, and you know I love the the how you hit on like the fact that we we not we need students to pursue careers in all domains, right? Like college, you know, skilled trades is a huge area which right. you know which is needed, right? Yeah. Um, how are we going to do these mega projects? How are we going to double our energy capacity here in, right. in Canada without skilled trades, right? right. And unfortunately, I think the perception is still out there 
in, in many, many ways that the skilled trades, oh, I'm not sure I want to do that. It's not what my parents might want. It's not what my family expects. And it's, it's absolutely needed and it's absolutely respected. And the world needs the skilled trades. And there's so many options and there's so many great careers, great pathways where you can be successful and happy and contribute. Um, universities place on the pedestal and it's, it has a great purpose and not taken away from that. But like you say, there are many other, th- many other pathways that are needed. Yeah. T- tell me about, you know, just some of your uh, observations in your classes. And, you know, throughout the years, have you seen a shift in, um, in student interest toward certain industries? Like, are they more interested toward tech or are they kind of now leaning a little bit toward energy uh, to a certain extent? What are students mostly interested in nowadays and how is that changing? It seems to be, I think, with whatever it seems to be popular within that generation. So we've seen different things. Uh, with COVID, I've seen a, a, a students maybe interested more in, in biology, in microbiology, in, 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 in cellular biology, in biochemistry. <clears throat> There's always been uh, a, a tech push as well. Um, so students were really interested in, in robotics, in STEM, in coding mathematics, that's, that's still there as well. Um, with climate change now being, not now, but it has been for quite a while, but especially trying to push it now in the new, in the new course, in the new grade nine course, uh, I haven't seen it just yet since it's so new, but I know we've talked more about it. Where is our energy coming from? Students don't know that you turn a light on, they power your cell phone. Where did that come from in Ontario? Where does it come from if you do that somewhere else in the world and how and why is that different? So I'm hoping that there's going to be this, this movement now. Uh, with respect to energy, they're excited when we talk about things. When we, when we talk about um, uh, solar, solar panels, especially what they've seen a lot of in Ontario is, is, the, is uh, wind power. They see uh, wind farms and they wonder and they ask how it works, which is great. Um, they don't know as much about nuclear, but they're, when we talk about it, they're always interested in it. So I know there's interest. And once we talk about it, and once we once we start to look at the bigger picture about the benefits and 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 how that's going to continue to play an important role and how it has to play an important role, uh, that's when I can see their interest peak. If something, if a show comes out on Netflix, Chernobyl, let's say, or something else, then their kids are talking about it. That's a great opportunity then for an educator to say, all right, let's talk about Chernobyl. Let's talk about. Um, all the safety precautions that are here now and how that's very different now. And that's, that's, uh, 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 that's how we lead into the topic. We get into, sci- into uh, science literacy, uh, media literacy, that's important. Um, talk about different ways to produce energy and that they're really interested. So I haven't seen uh, a, a noted difference in let's, say, in, let's say, specific interest in energy production, but Definitely when we talk about it, you can see, oh, I didn't know that nuclear does all this. And I didn't know that's how exactly how it worked or how, or how safe it can be. Um, the misconception often part of it is, well, it produces waste. Yes, but watch this video on how it's properly stored, right? Really interesting, really interesting. And yeah, it's, it can be safely stored. So that, and that it's an aha moment for them. Oh, that's how it's done. All right, so it isn't as bad. And I, I can see that now. So it's in those moments where I see, yes, there is an interest. So that, I think, has changed now that we're talking more about it. That's great. No, it's great to know that, you know, students have that interest and, you know, really appreciate you in, uh, inviting me um, uh, to, give, to give kind of like a guest lecture at the school. Mm-hmm. And I, I saw for myself, like, students and their reaction, it was, it was really positive and it was very, very inquisitive. Mm-hmm. And um, maybe it's because they don't, you know, they, they didn't really have that negative perception. They kind of saw nuclear energy from more of a curiosity perspective. Mm-hmm. A lot of kids interested in engineering had a lot of great questions for me, and um, I really appreciated the opportunity. So, sir, t- tell me about the perceptions about nuclear energy amongst educators, right? Um, when it comes to educators I- in general, um, from, you know, f- from your thoughts engaging with Ministry of Education from teachers all across you know, the province or from Canada, is there certain perceptions about nuclear energy or mm. a certain type of technology that's, that's prevalent amongst educators? Um, I think, because I mostly work with science educators, not only for sure, because there's work with a whole variety of cross-curricular teachers and teach from other subjects. So 
But what I, when, we, when this topic it usually comes up with science teachers, and I'm fortunate to work with a bunch of great teachers that stay informed, and when they're not, they go learn, and they ask, and we, and we talk about it. We really do talk about these things over lunch. We're, I love being geeks in this, in the, in this field, because this is, it's, it's fascinating. We learn from each other. There is a desire to learn more, because we're not in that field, and so we're looking for resources and where those resources are, they can be in our textbooks, they can be, they can be online, they can be in, uh, in, in YouTube, they, they're, are, they're out there and teachers are willing to, to do that. Um, well beyond our allotted time schedule, we, we love that where it's, it's for me, it's, I, I, I tell my students, I do science on the weekend, I do science at nine o'clock at night. Um, while I'm marking, I'm also scrolling through some, some news article I have or reading, reading a paper. I just like to do that. And I know science teachers here like to do it as well. So they, I think science teachers generally, they do have, at least from my experience, they do have a positive outlook on, on nuclear energy. So I think what, what we might need is, and I think you alluded to that already, touched on that, was um, if, if the industry can reach out to the colleges and universities and possibly even the high schools and say, look, this is, this is where the need is. It's interesting. You can contribute to it. Here are some facts about it. Here's material that's accessible to a grade nine student. And here's material that's accessible to a grade 12 physics student who's learning all about those, those complex formulas and those concepts. And I, I think if, if we all work in different layers together, like you alluded to, I think that's how we can get kids more interested in in, in, the, in the nuclear field in that, in that space. Um, but teachers are willing to learn and I think we would appreciate those resources. Right now we're our own resource and we, we find things. So yeah, I think we have a good perception of it. That, that, that's great, that's great. And there's such an open mind to, mm -hmm. to explore those topics and, and things are changing fast even in the industry, right? So like when it comes to reactor technologies, those are developing at a faster rate, mm -hmm. at a faster pace and you know, in terms of those educational resources that you spoke about, what would be the most effective types of educational resources? You know, is it, is it, the, is it like a video which you can share with your students and they click in on YouTube, it's very accessible, or is it more of um, paper format resources? Is it like already kind of built PowerPoint presentations which you can share with students? What is something that reduces friction and it's easy for students to get access to? So I think it will be all of those, all of those things. So it'd be great video to play for them that's accessible to them. Excellent. Here's a link. Let's show it in class and we'll talk about it. We'll debrief afterwards. Um, we can have a conversation discussion about that. Um, uh, print material would be great as well. Even that is not necessarily meant for students, but here's something for a science educated teacher, science teacher. You can, you can use this here. Let me pull out what are those innovations? Because we don't often have access. We might, we might have access to it, I suppose, but we don't have it delivered if it were in some way delivered in a way that teachers have access to. So there are some great organizations around the province. I, I'm, I'm going to lean towards the Science Teachers Association. So if you connect with, with professional associations like those, then they are skilled. We're skilled at sending those out, delivering it. Um, workshops will be created by teachers. I know I've done some myself, presented to teachers across the province on topics that interest me. Um, uh, on not only how we teach on the pedagogy of things, but also on on technology, on pathways, on, on, on how do you teach this one strand, this one topic. Um, that is one way, connecting with associations. Uh, some universities even, they, they publish material that's sent. So the University of Waterloo does a great job at this as well through a chemistry paper, that they, a, a magazine that they publish. Um, they send teachers this. Every, every month I believe I get a copy or is it every quarter? I have to I have to check that, but I get a copy from them, and you know there's great resources there uh, with with examples, with articles, um, things. Some things might be meant for the students. Some things are meant for teachers to use and then to develop. So it's a combination of all of those. So certainly, uh, YouTube videos, media in that sense, that electronic sense would be great. Print would be great. Uh, Ready-made lessons. Then there's teachers willing to do that in these in these organizations like Steo willing to help with that. So all of that I think has to work together for if it's going to be successful in the way that we that we need it to be. What is the most effective way for the industry to get those resources to educators and then educators to to get those to get those resources to students? And and how how do you streamline that in somewhere in like Ontario or Canada? Right. So what 
what I would suggest would be great is uh, maybe a few ways. So the industry, they, they, they could develop their own resources and that would be great. Um, and they can, I'm sure we'll get many hits. You'll, you'll be able to, to connect with boards and teachers. And if it's, if it's delivered in something accessible, like a, like a social media, then that's even better because kids are all over that, so are teachers. Um, but there are already professional organizations that exist <clears throat> that can disseminate that information and that already have the infrastructure and resources in place to do that, and that can do it effectively. So um, I can speak, f I can speak for, for uh, how, how it might happen with groups like, like the Science Teachers Association of Ontario. We would we could send it out to uh, contacts that we already have at, at different boards of education, and that then goes to, and then is disseminated by a person at the board, whoever that may be, to teachers, directly to teachers' inbox. Um, there, there could be so that so that's how the that's how the board would disseminate that. And that's how these professional organizations do it as well. Um, other universities publish make publications about about um, different topics too. So bringing awareness to it, uh, resources for teachers as well through universities is another is another avenue. So there are several ways to do it. There, are, I would take advantage. Um, of, of those professional organizations that already have these systems established. I think that's a great way. Also, yeah, for sure, get in contact with, with boards and, 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 and with schools, that would be another way to do it too. Combination of that would be perfect. Uh, for sure, take advantage of what is already present. Again, those organizations that are there willing to do that. Nice, what are some of those boards? Um, can you name some examples of, uh, of the, the professional organizations that you would, you would recommend reaching out to? What are some of those top professional organizations, and then also in terms of boards, there's so many district school boards, right, in Ontario and across Canada. Yeah, Where's a centralized that. resource to like get those contacts and <clears throat> even get, get started? I suppose the ministry would have a list of all these boards. I haven't seen one, they, they, I'm sure they do, but I haven't seen one published anywhere. What I, I, to be honest, I haven't looked, but I know that it's been um, a bit of a, so I know for, for, for Steo, we've, called them we've it's been it's been working i know there's a list and i haven't been the one to do it so i will not, not not take credit for it but uh there are these contacts made and it's just emails and phone calls made to who these people are because at boards the positions might change um consultants uh coordinators for science or for math and uh, they, they might change, so it might be one person one year, it might be somebody else another year, so these contacts are being made. I'm not sure there's a very easy way to do it, um, but that's why I suggest getting, getting into contact with those groups that are already in contact with boards, they would be able to help disseminate, and it's part of what, of what we do, part of, part of their mandate to, to do that. Um, to name, I have to think about, for sure, I've already mentioned STEO, but there are other groups too. There's a, I'm gonna get this wrong, there's a physics group as well, O-A-M-E is for math. Don't ask what the acronym is, I forget. Uh, but O-A-M-E is for math. They have, there's another group for, for chemistry as well. I believe it's, it's through Guelph. So University of Guelph, their chemistry department is awesome. Uh, visited the, their chemistry department who brought kids out to their, to their, um, to their labs. Uh, they have publications as well, so it's great to get in contact with them. I know I'm missing a ton, I'm sure, but that's, that's it. And, and I'm sure, not sure there's an easy way to get in contact with everyone, with all the, all the boards, but there are groups that exist that already have those contacts that might be able to help. That's great. Um, STEO, you said STEO, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what does that stand for? Science Teachers Association of Ontario. Okay. Yeah, great, great organization. Um, Pre-COVID, we have our yearly conference, massive conference, well attended, working on another conference right now for, for August. Uh, post COVID, be first the first time we have a, 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 a in person conference again after COVID. We've had uh, great virtual conferences, so it's Steo has a, a great uh, great reputation, great name. Teach science, every science teacher knows who Steo, what Steo is. Um, so that's that'll be a great way to um, share, a great way to expand. Absolutely, no, that definitely. Um, you know, one 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 question I have, another question I have for you, sir, is. You know, nowadays we're looking at uh, the education space uh, quickly changing, mm -hmm. and and there's so many more, you know, resources available on the internet. There's influencers, right? Um, you know, people that are creating content out there and that are uh, creating content that is reputable, that is uh, backed by you know references. And mm -hmm. 
what are your thoughts on the role of uh, social media and uh, the new kind of age of education? How long do you want this video to be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's such an important topic. Um, part, of, part of science education for a long time, not, just, not even recently, has been science literacy. It's just become so much more, I think, important to talk about to address now. Because um, we ask ourselves and ask students, the first question asked, day one introduction, where do you get science? Where do you receive science? How do you experience science? And 100% of them say social media. Sure, it's going to be TikTok, it'll be Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, um, Spotify, pod, some kids are great, are into, 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 into podcasts, which is great. So where do they get that? That's where they get that. And it's a, it's a, those are all great platforms, all great tools to receive information. But then that also means that all information is received. You get all the kinds of information that maybe you don't want kids to, to, to receive without teaching them how to critically analyze what they're receiving or critically um, question, is this good information? And while you and I might be able to pinpoint something that is just silly, or a conspiracy theory for a grade nine, grade 10, grade 11, any student, even adults that haven't had this media literacy uh, um, education would believe. So you might get things that are silly like masks don't work or that vaccines don't work. And so that's really come out into the forefront. It's really been highlighted over the past little while with COVID. So show them examples in class, right? We, 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 it's important to teach what is fake news and how then can we determine what is fake? Is it being paid by somebody which would skew people's views and maybe make it um, less credible? Is there, are, there, are they trying to sell something? Alarm bells should go off if they're trying to sell something. So there's things that we teach them, things that we show them that this is what you need to consider when you see something. Who is, who is delivering it? What is the real message behind it? What is their intent? Are there references provided? Um, so those are just a few of the things we have students analyze. We let them watch a video um, and then analyze. Does that sound true? Does that sound real? Why do you think? Why do you think not? And so we, 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 those are activities that, we, that, I, that I've done, I do with my grade nines, um, knowing that science literacy is really important so important so that we make informed, we allow kids to leave high school as, as being informed, not just literate and that we can read, but also literate that we can make the right decisions. Which toothpaste, I tell them, which toothpaste is better than the other one and why? Or is it just the box that's marketing it really well to you? Um, I know I tell my students, you may not be a scientist when you leave high school or want to be a scientist when you leave high school, but if you can make a well-informed critical decision, that's the point of, of grade nine and grade 10. If you think this is a pathway for you, then we have great senior courses for you that will help prepare you for that. But if you don't decide to take science anymore past grade 10, that's, that's fine, choose your pathway. But if you can make a, critically, uh, a critical decision on everything in your life, it doesn't mean doing a lot of work, it's just being aware of how to approach those decisions, what the process is, then hopefully that's the goal of a grade nine, grade 10 science teacher. Yeah, I love, I love that approach of critical thinking because, you know, we're on that one hand, it's kind of like a double-edged sword, right? You have so many resources which are incredible. On the other hand, there are so many resources which are biased and right. <laughs> being funded by organizations with their own best interests in mind, yeah, and it's profits. Tell, and it's hard to tell which is which. So that's one flag that has to go off. Well, let's think about it. Who is, what's the purpose? And often influenced by who's paying for it, right? And that can be good and it can be bad, but it's hard to tell. Absolutely, and, and you know, tell me about the impact of that, right? Because when it comes to perceptions of a technology like nuclear, or when it comes to perceptions of medicine, like vital medicine, like vaccines we're seeing during the sure, COVID-19 sure. pandemic, <clears throat> that we're seeing those implications on human health, right? COVID numbers rising and impacts to the economy. And then also with energy, you know, we, we see policies like in Germany, right, which were influenced not by scientists and experts, but rather by philosophers and folks that didn't really have a science background. Right, right. And now the, the country is in an energy crisis. The, the whole continent yeah. is, is, um, is facing an energy crisis, That's right. right, and starting back up its nuclear reactors. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that large long-term impact. 
So without, never try to influence a student's point of view politically or not, but also show them that when you become a, a hopefully science literate and when you are a critical thinker, when you, you, you make decisions and part of that is deciding on who you might vote for, deciding on, on, on even decisions that you might personally make or, and, and, and calling up your government representative at different levels of government and saying, what do you, what do you think? Communicating, being, being civically active and communicate, what do you think about this technology? Otherwise you will get situations like you might have, like, like, like we have in, in, in Europe and Germany where you're, we're facing something that could have with proper planning and foresight maybe been improved or prevented, um, but a quicker fix, a cheaper fix would have been, is, and that was, was in that case, fossil fuels. So making those decisions, being able to then leave with a little bit more of science literacy, more background uh, to make the right decision, not just in the type of toothpaste you purchase, but also in who might get your vote and how you might be an active citizen and influence politicians that are already there without, of course, trying to persuade in, in, in any direction, but just having that background and then being able to make the right decision. It's massively important massively important because you do have people that may not be and that may not have a science background and those are politicians and that that's that's okay but then we need to make sure that those people that are hold that holding those those seats people of of, of power and, and and authority are open open and willing to accept the science information and and to make those well-informed decisions and if they're not then we have to collectively work as active citizens politically active citizens civically active citizens to work together to make it better, to prevent things like energy crises that, that could have been prevented or could have at least been mitigated. So we need really important in the energy space, in COVID, we need more communication, not just with COVID, with all health matters, all public health matters. We need important accessible communication for, for adults, for, for, for students, for everyone, so that we, they can see that, no, it isn't some conspiracy theory. There are no microchips inside it, something they might see on TikTok or Facebook, not picking on any, on any one platform, but they see it all social media that will influence. And we'll, what do we see? We see rising COVID numbers. We see a, a decrease in vaccinations. And unfortunately, it isn't, it, it isn't just one problem, it's many. And, and, and part of it, though, is being able to communicate this to them properly and um, helping them, giving them the tools they need to make the right decisions and getting that toothpaste that's better than the other one or not, or maybe even voting. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that unbiased approach and mm. being that guide for your students, but not necessarily dictating them yeah, what, yeah, what path they need to take. Online. Sure, sure. I really try. Everyone has their own opinions, right? But it, they, the whole point is make your own mind, make up your own mind. And this is how you can do it while being informed, um, objectively, and honoring your own values, right? Not trying to judge someone else for making the different decision, but what is good for you, given a, a process of uh, weeding out all of the fake news. It, it's great, it's refreshing to see that you're keeping up with the times and and, flex, and have that flexibility in right. your education model. Teachers are like are lifelong learners. I mean, we like it. I'm I'm, I'm into it. I uh, I'm in the field, of course, but I'm in it because I I, I want to see it grow. Um, I want to see students make those right decisions, have those tools. So it's it's important that we that we do stay up to date. So yeah, we love those resources if that ever comes to light or if it ever becomes if it gets into my mailbox and. And I hear a ding, wow, this is what I can teach in my class and this is how I can modify, excellent. I'm happy to, happy to receive that. You know, tell me a little bit about that as well. Like, I just want to pull the thread on that a bit. There's a structured curriculum for every single course and, and it takes a majority of the class time, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how mm -hmm. much room, how much buffer room is there to play with when it comes to uh, new updates or any other, you know, any other topics that, for example, an industry might want to share with you, would that be something a student would go look up in their own time or would it be, would it be something where you're teaching a physics class and, and nuclear fission comes up and you're like, hey, listen, this is relevant. So maybe I'll, I'll pull up this article or this newspaper or this video, which I just received and share that with the class. Sure. Oh, it's open. It's open, especially the intermediate courses, the grade nines and tens for sure, um, all, all grades actually all subjects there while there are basic fundamental concepts that have to be taught and are taught and 
And these are, we, we will always in that, within that curriculum address these. They're also open enough. So the curriculum is built so that we have these, what are called specific expectations. And then there's the overall expectation. So the, the mandate is that teachers achieve the overall expectation. The specific ones help us do that, but those specific ones are, are amenable. We can, so it might be a little bit open enough where it gives us direction, it gives the educator direction. So what all, for example, alternative sources of, or to, al alternative methods to generate electricity. That's pretty open. So if nuclear fusion becomes something tomorrow, we can talk about that. It's not in the curriculum, but it is because we, it, it, it does, it, does achieve an expectation, even an overall expectation that we can bring into the class. So there's certainly room to talk about innovation. In fact, I think there is in every, in every course, we need to talk about innovation and it's why we're happy as educators to receive those resources so we can help develop and disseminate. That's great, that's great. And, and, and tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, when it comes to class trips, right? Um, I, I certainly love that. That was one of the highlights of my, um, my high school experience mm -hmm. here. Uh, you know, whether it be touring maybe a nuclear reactor or, you know, for example, you gave the, the example of University of Guelph and their labs. Yeah. Uh, how much time is there in a, in, in a semester uh, or a term uh, for students to go on some of these trips and get that, get that experience outside of the, the regular classroom? There's time, especially for the grade 9 and 10 intermediate courses, there's time. Um, there is more senior, probably the U courses, there's just a lot more content universities need students to be prepared for, so I would say there's less time. But if, there's, if there is curricular connections to these trips, trips will help us achieve those expectations. So there is still time in all courses, and yes, for sure, anything that is hands-on, anything that is experiential, we need to bring students out for. Um, what then becomes a little bit of a challenge for the educator is planning because it's done often, it, it, takes a, it, it does take some time and it should because students have to have a proper educational experience, it has to be engaging, primarily has to be safe, uh, lots of T's and I's have to get crossed and dotted, so lots, lots has to happen, a lot has to happen, but once those relationships are, are, are established, it then becomes easier for the school, for the board, for the educator to do this, so that's really important. Love to get out to visit a nuclear power plant. Love to get out to talk to people within the field. We do that. Um, distance does limit a bit. It really does within the school day, but it it's, doesn't prohibit. Uh, I've, I've taken um, my eco club, uh, eco club group of kids out to Tobermory, right? And that's, that's not around the corner um, from Mississauga. So distance can be a factor, but with the right planning and, and, and the right um, assistance, resources, then we can do those types of trips. It does take time, but educators are happy to do it. Um, and students' experience is, is, is important. And that experiential part of learning is, is really impactful. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. That's great to know that there's, there's space for that. Out of the four years and looking at all the science programs, since you're the department head, I'm asking you this, because um, you probably have a really good understanding of where do you think are the best times uh, for for kids to come uh, come engage with nuclear facilities and develop a knowledge of clean energy, right? When it comes to just the energy energy topic in general, when would be the best times? You know, you said grade eleven or twelve is a bit of a, a little bit harder, a little bit harder, but like sure, in general, when, doable, sure. Um, so it's when well, when will it, would it be easier? So let me think. At the beginning of the year, things are starting off, getting kids introduced to the course. That might be, might be, it needs, we need, would need time to, to plan a trip like, like to, to go a little further outside of our region to plan. Um, but that might be a good time near the beginning of the year. If near the end of the year, so let's say near June, wouldn't be great. Oh, another time that wouldn't be great, I'll get to that. But near the end of the year, wouldn't be great because of exams. And exams, we want to keep kids in class preparing for it, that's, that's important. We want to add, we don't want to take them away from that to then maybe increase their anxiety behind it. So we don't go on trips near exams, which happens in two, uh, two times throughout the year. So it's the end of June um, and, and also right after Christmas break. So I'd stay away from Christmas, I'd stay away from um, then your 
um, semester one exams, usually around the beginning of, of January, middle, middle end, I should say, actually middle end of January. So not January, not around Christmas. So best times probably around second semester, around, um, what are we right now? February, March would be, would be great. Not, we're not close to exams. We've just come off the heels of, of our first semester. So now would be a great time around this time of year. So say February, March, April, probably October, November might be good. So it's the, the, we're settled in school. It gives teachers time to begin planning, making those connections, filling out those, those, those necessary forms, right, to get students involved, get students involved to show school boards, uh, administrators, parents that this is all being done, planned, planned safely, planned well. Um, so I think those are the right times, essentially avoiding exam periods and longer, longer breaks. So um, primarily Christmas. No, that's, that's great, uh, Mr. Sapita. And, you know, I really enjoyed this discussion and it was so great seeing you again. I, I love coming back to the school and... You don't and have to call me Sir Mr. Sapita <laughs> anymore. I'm no longer your teacher. Just, just a sign of respect. I, know, I, know. I get it. I get it. Yeah, and you know, Mr. you know, you look younger every day yeah, that I come meet you. <laughs> Try to continue that. I don't know. Yeah, and 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 for those watching, um, uh, you can you know you know you can check out Mr. Sapita on uh, your I'll attach his contact information yeah. in the description below, so you can uh, you can check out his socials and uh, his his email if you want to reach out to him. Sure, sure. And if there's anything that you want to share with the with the audience or um, anywhere they can follow you, I think it's something that we've talked about. We've talked about before science communication is so important so i'm thankful Thelma, for what for the work that you're doing i don't know if people realize the need yet for sci or how much certainly there's a need but how important it is for science communication uh so this is great your podcast your 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 youtube channel we need we desperately need this um collectively as a society so congratulations on that um I, I do have a, a YouTube channel, but it's really, it's really good for my kids. After COVID, I thought, let me put these videos, my lessons online so it can be accessible. And I have a couple of things posted, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm really in it. Just my space is a classroom. I love, I love social media. I would love to get more into it, but you know, time, time, like we talked about time, time is my thing. But so that's why I appreciate it. I, I, I turn to you and appreciate you, all the work you're doing and other science communicators around the world doing as well. Awesome. Great, great topics. Um, and, and I love this discussion. So thank you so much. And until uh, next time, see you guys. Thanks. Thanks.